There is a sacredness to the marketplace. There is a divinity there where we exchange the things which we have been able to manifest for other things. And that barter, that commerce, that trade is something which is a divine uh, vehicle. And it comes across the millennia as people exchange the goods and services that they find necessary. So there's the ancient traditions of a good deal. You're getting what you pay for, and what you paid for works the way it's supposed to. And it's been this way since the beginning of time. There's been a marketplace. There's been a way to exchange goods and services, and it's part of our sacred traditions. It's certainly true in the temple. The temple was a place of uh, a marketplace. A lot of it was about uh, paying taxes and how that should be apportioned out. But there's also another part of that community of business people that really uh, deserves some attention. Yeshua paid attention to it, and he looked at it, and he went in to the temple, and he saw collusion. He saw the, the rigging of the marketplace, as it were. And that's why he cleared out the temple. He cleared out the temple because the markets were cornered. Those in the business class who were part of the temple, protected, as it were, in their business dealings. They were shielding one another from the, from the risk of the marketplace. They were making it a closed system, a rigged deal. And Yeshua said, no, you're not going to do that. That's not really how it's supposed to be. And so he overturned their tables and scattered their coin. And they, they had a, a coinage that's interesting as well. They had a Triffian coin, which is mostly silver, 80% silver. And then they had the shekel, the denarii. So I want you to think about that. They were using different kinds of currencies for different things. Can you imagine? And so here today, we are using different kinds of currencies. We are Bitcoin traders looking for something other than the fiat currency, which is what we are most used to using. But the vulnerabilities of it are really... Uh, Shocking sometimes, as those vulnerabilities are exploited by those who want to all of a sudden shred value from the marketplace and then buy it back. And those, those business machinations are the cause of suffering of millions. And it is the same way with uh, the cultural things. So one of the, the most disturbing things about the culture of today is the change of the culture of today. And there are those who want to upend the culture of today, and it is causing an emotional fury that is uh, really surprising. And the nations of the world are very insecure in the cultural upending of everything that we know. And is introducing the possibility of an enormous amounts of violence. And that violence is what we are seeing right now. And it is a culturally induced violence. So the world's marketplaces are kind of stable, even though there's a lot of collusion and uh, the governments uh, favor one market over another. And it's a kind of catastrophic uh, favoritism there, a kleptocracy, they call it. It's a great name. But the cultural wars are having a very powerful effect on our marketplaces. And they are shifting how people are beginning to think about themselves and their own unique cultures. So what is it about the Western culture that just scares the living daylights out of most of the rest of the world? Well, it's out of control. So what do you think it is that frightens Mr. Putin? Well, that's a big question. Do you think it's his avarice, his lust for power and control? Well, he's, he is clearly an author, authoritarian. 
he is a dictator. And why does he impose dictate on his people and as much as he can around the world? And it's because of the preservation of the system that he is trying to build. And what is it that's the enemy of what he's trying to build? It's woke. Vladimir Putin does not want Western woke to run over the top of his culture, his civilization. I want you to, to consider that for a second. It's a powerful thing to understand that the liberal democracy that we are touting is, in fact, damaged. It is a corrupt system which has no moral clarity in it whatsoever. The standards are gone. There are no standards. Do whatever you want. You are free to do whatever you want, and there is no constraint on anything that you do. So those prosecutors that don't prosecute, it means that the thievery is free to continue. There is no consequence. There is no moral certitude that the marketplace and the town square are going to be safe. And it's a destabilizing reality, which is by design. Mr. Putin knows that his world, his classic Russian world, is about to be toppled. And he knows it. And the people around him know it. You know, if you read a little bit, I have done a little bit of reading. One of the, the people that's a uh, powerful influence on Mr. Putin is Alexander Dugan. And Dugan's been around for a while. He's got the ear of the Kremlin. And he's got the ear of the Kremlin for a reason, because he is advocating another kind of uh, system that goes beyond uh, liberal democracy. And, oh, he writes well and complicated stuff. But essentially, he is saying that, look, the way it's going now for Russia is not working. The Russian people are not going to be able to flourish in the kind of wild democratic liberalism that's being spread around the world. It's not a healthy thing. The Russian people and Mr. Dugan and Vladimir Putin know that. They know it's unhealthy. And they're doing everything they can to stop it. And uh, we, as the liberal West, are doing everything we can to infiltrate that system and turn it around and turn it into something that the, the classic culture of Russia is going to rebel against. It's not going to like it. That's not who they are. They want to try and maintain that culture of thousands of years. And it's uh, quite an amazing thing. So you can see where Mr. Putin is incredibly frustrated by the advances of the West right on his border. He needs the buffer. He doesn't need the buffer militarily. He needs the buffer culturally. He needs to be able to direct and control the Russian culture to, in his mind, form it into a way that suits his historic view of the Rus, the people of Russia. And we are busily chipping away at everything he's trying to uh, build in his culture. Now he's very ham-handed about it. <laughs> he's pretty aggressive. He's got a He's got some real problems with authority and, you know, the, the essence, though, is that the people of Russia seem to want that kind of cohesion. They want their traditional view, and that traditional view is very important to them, and they don't want to have it destroyed by a bunch of wokes and all of the things that that woke implies. They really don't want that kind of world. And they are willing to do whatever it takes to prevent woke. So this may be a simplistic view, but uh, if you look at the patterns of our diplomatic efforts, they are directed to introduce a kind of woke in their society and to surround them with Western woke. They are not threatened by democracy. Well, they might be, but <laughs> they're more threatened by woke. They just simply don't want it. And they are willing to do some horrible things 
to get it out of their lives. And so those are the forces that I see working in that culture and in ours. It is the defiling of the marketplace here. The sanctity of our marketplace has been completely lost. There is no honor in the marketplace. There is collusion and corruption, cornering of markets, destroying competitors, censoring ideas, confusing the marketplace. And it is a, it is a thing which needs to be addressed and seen clearly. And that is part of the work that I think is in this work that I do. It is how do you get clarity on that? Well, the only way that I know to get clarity on it is to connect with the divine hierarchy. That's where the answers are going to come from to solve the questions of woke and the corruption of the marketplace and our banking systems. These are fake institutions in the fact that they are, they are not really legitimate institutions. The consequences of them are very real. That's not fake. So our question at least my question is, how do we go ahead and find the clarity and the beauty that is necessary to begin to restore those things that we love and like and depend on for stable marketplaces and, and honest banking? You know, what coins do you use to pay your temple tax? Do you use a shekel, a denarii, a triffian? You know, those are questions then, you know, what, what coin are we going to use? You know, it's, a, it's still the question today. And these are destabilizing influences. And it's unfortunate that some see that as an opportunity, a place where they can get advantage. They can assert themselves and secure for themselves fortunes and power. That is, in my mind, the essence of why Yeshua was killed. He was seen as a threat to the business interests of the temple. I mean, there was some, some things there that are certainly part of the theological traditions, the, the, the traditions of the, uh, of the temple priesthood, but it was mostly business. And that's what Pilate saw. He said, well, I, you know, I don't see anything. You know, he just sort of washed his hands of it because it was, it was, it's business. That's what he, that's what he's kind of dismissed it in a way. You guys want to do business? Okay. Well, life is cheap and, you know, we've just crucified tens of thousands of people. So one more, do you want for your business, uh, do that. And that is not unique to uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Try and get in the way of a business operation that's uh, one that's protected by our government and see where you get. You know, you're going you're gonna to find yourself, oh my gosh, steamrolled. You know, you can, and the, the, the cases are, are endless. There's one great case that it's not that familiar anymore, but it's the, the cases of the bus services, General Motors, building buses. Well, what did they, what did they have to do in order to, to get people to buy buses? They had to destroy the railway systems. They had to destroy all of these city transit systems, which were powered by little trams and trains and trolleys and all this kind of stuff. They wiped it out, and they were sued, and they lost the suit after, of course, they'd sold a gazillion buses. And the payment for the suit was $1. So General Motors destroyed the transit system of the United States in order to sell buses. So some things never stop, and it's, it's quite the shame, but you know it is really important that the people that are organizing themselves to run our business and our government, uh, they need to be watched and they need to be understood because those, those interests, the powerful amounts of capital that are behind them need to be kind of examined a little bit. And it's important to stay focused on that and to stay in our meditation and contemplation as we view how these events and circumstances are playing out across the world. And there are some who are taking advantage of the crisis, the chaos, and the trauma. They want it to be that way. And it 
it's a great sad thing. So join me in meditation and prayer to find the right way to view these events and understand their true nature so that we are not caught in hysterias and traumatized by psychotic crazies who are trying to run our information and communication systems. So I urge you to seek your prayer closet and your meditation cushion and join me. Amen.